Welcome. I'm pleased to open this press conference and to share our program for this afternoon. I'm Julia Wintner, Eastern Art Gallery Coordinator, and I'm excited to have this exhibition at Eastern because we support Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's fight for freedom. We stand against any military invasion. Personally, I left Russia in 1989 with the dawn of perestroika, and I have been following this conflict since its beginning in 2014 with annexation of Crimea. The war is not just about Ukraine's national independence. This war is indicative of global trend where we observe a resurgence of authoritarianism across the globe. We must pay attention to Ukraine because I believe that the future of democracy is at stake. Um, well, I'm, I'm excited to share the order of our presentations. Um, Dr. Nunes will speak, will share her remarks next. Dr. Nunes is a, is a president of Eastern Connecticut State University. Monica Fabianska, uh, the curator of this exhibition will speak next. Fabianska is a work is a is a New York based art historian and contemporary art curator. She specialized in women's and feminist art. Her remarks will be followed by Lesa Komenko. Komenko was born in Kiev. She graduated from the National Academy of Fine Arts and Architecture in 2004. She creates painting, installations, performances, and videos, um, which she compares history and myth and reveals tools of visual manipulation. These are three yeah, paintings uh, by Komenko, and one is um, on the front wall of the gallery. In conclusion, Ilya Friedman, a director of Friedman Gallery in New York, the um, originating venue for this exhibition. In attendance, Professor Dr. Uh, Caitlin um, Karinen, uh, Karinen, Professor of History and the expert in foreign policies, and her students will be available for comments on the context behind the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Jennifer Brown, Dean of An of academic analytics uh, in attendance as well. Following the press conference, the art gallery will open, will be open to the public. We'll begin with, at 3 p.m. with a talk by, um, by Monica and Alessia, and um, 4 p.m. reception for the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Well, let me begin by thanking each of you for attending this afternoon. And this is such an important moment in Eastern's history. Uh, and let me also begin by thanking you, Julia, for uh, bringing the exhibition to Eastern. We're very proud that it's here. It's, an, as I said, an emotional moment for us. And we feel so honored that uh, you chose to bring the exhibition to this university. Julia has a stellar record at Eastern for uh, uniting the values of Eastern with the exhibitions in this gallery. And this is an, a very good, very good example of how the values of Eastern are exemplified uh, in the way that the exhibit is presented. So Julia, thank you for doing this. And she also talks to us about her experiences in Russia and has, has shared many a moment that has left us with deep, deep feelings about her experiences and why she's so connected to this particular exhibit. I wanted to say that Eastern is a very welcoming place. We had the first black professor in the state here at Eastern in the early 1950s. We have the highest number of professors that are people of color and staff that are people of color. And most recently, we have the highest number of immigrant students with the classification of DACA. That means that they are not allowed to go to school in the states. Those are Mississippi, for example, Georgia, Missouri. And because they're not allowed to go to college in those states, they have come to Eastern with economic support from the DOT Dream US Foundation. I give you those examples of how Eastern has a deep, deep 
history of a welcoming place to immigrants and to people who are displaced. And we will continue to do that for many, many centuries to come. It is in our DNA. Art, as you know, has the ability to transport us as individuals. I came into this exhibit and saw instantly that I was transported to the pain and suffering of the people of Ukraine. That pain and suffering has been transformed into beautiful paintings that show us the connection between pain and suffering and at the end of the day, beauty and hope. There's hope in this exhibit and the hope is that people will be able to establish themselves in the democracy that they see is so important to them and the democracy that they have worked so hard for. So for us, this exhibit and the artists who have put it together have connected us to the war, women at war, and the war itself, and the meaning that it has for individuals who live in the Ukraine and individuals who are supporting the Ukraine, like us at Eastern. Finally, I wanted to say that Eastern um, is very happy to host the exhibit, but knows that the exhibit will be traveling to other places in the United States. And what's so important about a traveling exhibit like this is that Americans all over this country will be able to see the exhibit and hold the mirror up and look into the mirror and say, these individuals are fighting for a democracy fighting for their freedoms. How do we as Americans continue to fight for our freedoms and protect this great democracy? Thank you for bringing the exhibit to Eastern. Thank you, it will be hard to follow in your footsteps. Uh, but first of all, as curator of this exhibition, my name is Monica Fabianska again, I would like to extend my, and also on behalf of all of the artists, uh, Ilya will uh, also, I'm sure, um, join in his own words, uh, to express our incredible gratitude for your hospitality for this exhibition, uh, both to President Nunez and to uh, Julia Wintner, who worked on bringing it here uh, incredibly hard to do it in such a short time. I've never seen this happen, that an exhibition would go on tour two weeks after it closed at the original venue where the, uh, there was no plan originally in place to tour. Well, we didn't have a plan for this exhibition, as you can imagine. It was uh, created in reaction to, to the war that had uh, broke out, that had broken out in, in February. And um, there's our great hope that uh, what Yulia started uh, by inviting it here Will, will indeed become a longer tour of this exhibition. And we all remember what Guernica, I always say, Tout Proposion Garde, one huge painting that for Spain back then, what this many dispersed, tiny, often drawings by women can do for Ukraine uh, here. Um, we hope that this will keep happening and it will keep telling their own stories. This is not one story, this is not a monolith. Uh, I hope that what you will uh, take from this exhibition will be this polyphony of voices uh, that tell us different experiences and that focus on different aspects of the war. So if I could uh, give just a um, few directional ideas, I hope that you will follow later with questions um, because I don't want to uh, develop them too long here. Uh, the works that you see in the exhibition, roughly half of them uh, were created during the eight long years since the war started in 2014, when we in the West didn't necessarily pay much attention to what was going on in Ukraine. And roughly half of the works were created after the full invasion, full-scale invasion started in February of this year. Um, and they are not divided, they are interspersed and you see how they are in, in dialogue. Um, many works in the exhibition uh, refer to Donbas, uh, that post-industrial area of, um, of Ukraine, uh, the land of mining, uh, which is such a hot topic in, in the time when we speak about extraction and how wars are tied to extraction and to the reaches of the earth. 
Uh, there are a lot of social issues uh, going on in, in, in Donbas, tied to a long history of the country. I'm very happy that this exhibition is happening at the university where classes can come here with history professors or policy professors and, and discuss these different, different, different aspects um, of the works. What um, was my main inspiration uh, for laying this exhibition this way and not the other uh, was my long time interest in, in the silence that I hear whenever I look back and look at the history. Because what we got from the previous generations, the outline of history that we all know from Sumerian text, the Bible, the Iliad, the Odyssey, even if they are female characters or heroines, the perspective is usually male. And I was simply interested how what would happen if we would give the floor to talk about the war to women without necessarily a preconception of what we would, uh, what we would hear. So what you will see in the exhibitions are some of the works, some of the works comment on particularly, um, let's say, women's fates, fates that are attached to traditionally, uh, traditional gender roles. Uh, in the society, women who are mothers escape with their children. Women are predominantly raped so much more often than men are, even though everybody is raped. People of no gender are also raped in Ukraine and in every war. Um, then there are women who give birth during the war. So these are specific uh, situations that happen to them. But what is a very different, or for example, in Lessie's uh, paintings, we see the fate of soldiers, which is also a predominantly gendered situation. Um, her painting, Max in the Army, on the other side of this wall, um, speaks about speaks to her separation uh, with her with her husband, which is the fate of so many couples in Ukraine today. Yet another dimension, personal dimension of the war. But another group of works in the exhibition do not necessarily focus on women's fate. Uh, they focus on seeing the war beyond uh, shooting uh, battles and a concept of the victory and the defeated. They really look at the lives of regular people who are left behind often, behind the um, the war front in Donbas, and for various reasons, they would not leave their homes. We all know situations like this from, for example, New Orleans when Katrina came, right? So who stays and why people stay at home? And um, what happened to them? Is there any narrative around them in the media? Uh, and where are they in the, po in the great politics? Uh, importantly, Evgenia Belarus's um, series of photographs of miners working in Donbas while shelling is around them, titled uh, her series, The Victory of the Defeated. So I leave you with, with those ideas. Um, I think that it's uh, an important, this, this exhibition is an important, tiny little introduction or insight into Eastern European feminism. I will only make a remark that because of historical developments, and political currents, it's quite different than in the West. So it's an invitation to delve into this and, and research a little bit. Um, as you probably know, there is uh, an essay that I wrote for the exhibition and it's available on the gallery's website. And we hope, uh, well, Yulia was much faster with bringing this exhibition to Connecticut, to Connecticut than we were with finishing the catalog, but I hope you will get it before the exhibition close. And I think that this is uh, fair enough for the introduction, and I'll be very happy to answer your, your, your questions later. This, yeah. Oops. Hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the university to invite us uh, and to give us more visibility, because I find it's very important now to, um, to get um, some language to produce, some language to speak about what is uh, actually not, isn't possible to express what war is. Because I'm wor I was working with the issue of the war since 2015, I guess, and like my main uh, focus was on the problem that the 
it's impossible to share experience what it's uh, be into the war, what it's to be represent country which is under the war. And I was talking with my colleagues from different countries who are in the war, like in different, uh, is around the world. And it's the same problem. It's, it's experience which is impossible to share. So it was a task for the, my generation of artists how to develop the language. And we worked a lot, but this uh, full invasion, which started on February uh, 24th, changed our experience completely to the opposite. Uh, because I, I was based in Kiev, and it's a capital, and it was safe. And I could develop a different kind of uh, researches about the war from the safe position, from the distance. But when war started, we like was was this uh, distance uh, from the war and the scale of the war, the scale of the violence, it's un incredible. Uh, that's why the references to the World War uh, II uh, are very important and a lot of my friends and colleagues are also work with this historical, um, in this historical perspective. Uh, and my painting, uh, paintings, are also uh, dealing with the history because uh, like Ukraine is a post-Soviet country and our art system, art education system, it's deeply uh, in the uh, 19th century still in figurative painting and this, that kind of approaches. So I'm both uh, working with uh, like this figurative painting by deconstructing it and as well as uh, the problem of a cyber war and the informational manipulation and the layering of uh, different obscuring of the image, uh, different pixels, uh, different muting, different uh, manipulation uh, with the digital images. I think it's also very important in the context of maybe COVID of past years because our world turned to digital one and we experience everything through digital. And I think it's, it goes in complex now, especially here, because war is too far for you and you could experience, as me now, because I'm also here, only through internet. Uh, so I'm asking myself and my public, what does it mean to experience such big tragedies through, through digital world? And another thing I would sh like to share with public and with you, firstly, it's, uh, kind of uh, possibility to project on yourself this kind of experience. And it goes through my personal experience, through my husband who is in territory defense now, is in army. Uh, he's a new media artist and uh, musician. And he's got to army like in February. And I was very curious what it looks like. And we are calling uh, and talking every day, but uh, it's not allowed to send photos. And he did one photo shoot, uh, like not illegally, but with on a quite safe background without any details. And uh, for me, it's also a role, role of photography itself that it's dangerous to take photos. So it's changed a lot the medium itself. And through this, uh, through his image, uh, I would like to share experience that everyone get into the war, this civil world get into the military war, and it's merge um, a lot, even uh, USA, US society involved a lot through paying taxes. So I would like for everyone to think what, how society will change with this. I think it's very important because it's also my figures are quite abstract, and it's about, about also humanity and new condition of humanity after, after such huge war, <laughs> I would say. So. Thank you. Um, my name is Ilya Friedman. I am the founder and director of Friedman Gallery in New York City. Um, I've had the enormous privilege to host this exhibition in New York, uh, to work with Monica on organizing it and uh, producing it. And 
This exhibition to me is important on a couple of levels. One is oppressed people everywhere are denied the opportunity to record their own history. And this is an example of contemporary artists making a visual and textual record of their own time. So it will survive as um, evidence that Ukrainians define their own culture. The other um, important aspect of this show and what gives it such currency is that this war in a very real way is about erasing Ukrainian culture as an independent national identity. And an exhibition like this um, is intended as a resistance effort, as an anti-war effort, because it does precisely the opposite. It promotes, it elevates Ukrainian culture as a unique phenomenon. Um, a lot of people send money to Ukraine, a lot of people in the West, in the United States, sell their own art and send the proceeds to Ukraine. But what is equally, if not more important, is to actually learn what Ukrainian culture consists of. The music, the visual arts, the literature. Um, the more we do that, and the more this show travels, the likelier it is that Ukraine has won already. Because the war is about denying them the possibility of independence, cultural independence. So thank you for hosting this show, and um, I hope it travels forever, basically. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Do we have any questions? And we are happy to open the floor for uh, questions from, from press or from students, from anybody. Yes. Does this exhibit the entirety of what was shown at your gallery? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, there was one more video. I'm not sure if it's uh, looped on the back of the one on the monitor, but uh, it, it looks pretty complete, yes. I was just curious, what is the breakdown between artists that are female versus the artists that are male? And also, I'm curious about the biographical backgrounds of the artists that put this together. Um, if, if there's a lot of variety in terms of their experiences, what, what they've done. Um, all the artists in the exhibition are women. Uh, all of them. That's, an, that's in the title, Women at War. Um, in New York, there was also a work by an artist who is, um, uh, I don't know even how to use the words properly because it's a process for her. Uh, the war traumatized her to the point where she started to consider herself as a non-binary persona and as a site of several personalities. I, I don't see this work here. I don't know if it fit the gallery. But yes, it is about, uh, the woman's experience, and we've had a conversation with her, how she defines herself. She said, I, I'm still a she. <laughs> so it, it's, it's very interesting how, um, how we can, I don't know if we can set this clear division anymore, uh, but clearly for the majority, I actually hope that I would be, my personal hope when I started this exhibition, the research for it, was that I would be able to deny this clear division of roles of men and women in, in the war. Uh, because of course, 25% of Ukrainian army are women today. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, men, uh, people of all genders are being raped. So is there any difference? I hope there is no, but it's not true. The majority of the society, for the majority of the society, the experience of war is when actually this divide becomes greater and, and more painful. And for many artists in the exhibition, the question is what agency women do have during the war. They really um, are not happy with the role of a victim, uh, to put it this way. And you asked about the experience of the artists. Um, 
they represent um, quite a um, panorama in terms of generations. Um, the youngest artist in the exhibition, I believe, is 27, the oldest in her early 60s among the living artists. Um, so that already is two or three generations in actual art world. Uh, and interestingly enough, many of them were either born in the Donbas region of Ukraine or uh, made works about Donbas. So there is strong leaning towards there. But of course, in every country, uh, arts focus in, arts are in the capital. So most of artists uh, before the war were active, active in Kiev. And yes, they do have very, very varied uh, biographies. One artist who is sort of an anchor for the entire exhibition, Awa Horska's uh, Lina Cap from 1963. It's the only historical work that grounds contemporary artists in a long legacy of women's art and political activism in Ukraine that goes back, in her case, to 1960s, um, and in the case of other artists, to even earlier times. So it's also an important effort on our part in claiming or reminding of Ukrainian uh, cultural identity. And our horse car may not be well known in the West yet, but she is, she, she was to Ukrainian culture what Frida Kahlo is to Mexican culture. So I invite you to research her work much better, much deeper. How are you connected to the artists and were there any logistical challenges in bringing their art overseas given the state of the war and everything? Ilya, do you want to address it? <coughs> Uh, so, well, I've known Lesia for, um, I don't know, seven years now, something along those lines. Um, and it's actually through Max, her sound artist husband, turned soldier, um, that we met. He was presenting a project at the Venice Biennale. Um, I am interested in sound art, and so I was drawn to that. Um, I met Lesia and brought both of them to the gallery several years ago um, to present a screening. Um, fast forward to 2022, and when Monica and I started to discuss this exhibition, it was important for us to have um, a Ukrainian gallery on board, and so the show is co-presented <coughs> co with Valoshan Gallery from Kiev, and they were instrumental in connecting us to several of the artists in the show. Um, and then Monica did just a valiant effort, truly unimaginable effort, of organizing essentially a museum exhibition in three months. Um, that involved a deep dive into Ukrainian contemporary art, conversations with her colleagues, trips to Warsaw, um, where she was able to meet with some of the artists in person, and then shipping logistics that included giving work to friends who crossed the border by car, uh, included relying on shippers with weeks long delays, um, work seemingly lost in transit, um, printing many of the uh, works and certainly framing all of the works uh, here in New York uh, and so on. So it was a, it was a, um, a variety of methods to, to bring this show together on uh, very short notice. I may, I may only want to add that when we started this exhibition, uh, well, I didn't know the artists except for Awa Horska and Rana Kadyrova's work, who I, whom I knew from, which I knew from Venice. Uh, biennials, uh, I didn't know the artists. It, it was the result of, of the research, uh, the conversations with the Oceans, and then just pure uh, art research. But um, when I was already, when I selected the artists and when I was in touch with them, that's mid March, uh, all of them were in Ukraine. And well, you were not already probably, but it's it's moral. You were, or maybe you you still were. It's it's really when people started to to leave the country. Some of them earlier, some of them a few days later. 
um, in the next, during the, in the course of the next two, three months until the uh, exhibition opening in, in New York City, almost all of them became, you don't want me to use this word, refugees. So you have to imagine asking somebody for, you know, a high-res JPEG and not having an answer for two weeks because things that are happening in their lives are so much greater than the, than the JPEG. But on the other hand, in a few cases, so it was very, very difficult in, a, in, a, in really in a, the human matter. The working with the artist was extremely complicated because each of them had a different situation in their life and different psychological framework for this. Uh, what I discovered, and which was very interesting, was that for, for a few of them, this, kind, this, this exchange was almost like help like something that was to do every day that would carry you to the next day. Oh, there is an exhibition in New York. There is something I have to do. There is a task. I have to write my bio. I have to do this. And we would basically be in touch every single day over text, over WhatsApp or Instagram very often some, with some of them over something else. So I had like 12 channels that I was constantly watching. And, um, and it was, for me, it was also a way of, of checking on them. Like, how are you? Right? So it, it's, it's, it's not like curating normally looks like, no. I had a question for the artist about the process, um, whether she felt it was a therapeutic experience for her and also how, how did you process her various emotions while, while creating your, your pieces and you know, trying to get the message across in your pieces. I would imagine that was challenging to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, to work in a studio, to produce works or to think about works is a, uh, it saved me. I mean, uh, this uh, image of my <coughs> husband, it was first work I did after the beginning of full invasion, uh, full scale invasion. It was, I did it in March uh, in Ukraine, but in West Ukraine, uh, not in Kiev. We escaped Kiev next day. Uh, and I moved for this six months, uh, I moved about 20 times. And in every new place, I organized studio for myself. Uh, mostly I was uh, on different art residencies, and now as well. Uh, but I'm working with a big scale, so it's quite technically difficult. Uh, but for me it's very important, uh, uh, first because um, the way I'm thinking as an artist, I'm deconstructing all information when I, which I got by my method which I developed, by critical consciousness, critical kind of thinking. So I produce distance to the problem and it help, helps, helps me to like survive as a human. Uh, okay, when Bucha happened in uh, early April, uh, I, pro I was producing for meters, I don't know, in feet. It's like very huge, like this long as this room paintings, very big ones. But I was crying and it was very, very difficult to paint or to work because it was too much. Uh, after Bucha, uh, they escalated, uh, they, they occupied it and we got this news about it. Uh, but in, in general, it, help, it helps me. When I'm not working for a few weeks, I became, you know, struggling more. So in human dimension, it's important, and in professional dimension as well, because uh, it helps me. But for artists, sometimes uh, being, in, being in the middle of the, I don't like word conflict, but let's say conflict, uh, uh, it's very difficult to produce this distance, to understand what happened in general, and very easy just to react, react emotionally on, on events. So I'm, I, I'm trying to avoid this. So I challenge myself, uh, myself twice, being like quite calm in my mind, <laughs> to observe from a bigger distance, uh, to observe it from a history, history perspective, and to think about what will be 
about future and so on. So I mean, I'm challenging myself, but it, it's the same makes me uh, more, more quiet, or calm. I don't know if, if my answer is clear. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's difficult, but at the same time, it's very helpful. Was there a goal of including a lot of different mediums in this exhibit? Um, that's a good question. Uh, <coughs> usually in my group exhibitions I have greater variety of mediums. I, I think that it's always exciting to have works of all kinds. Here, uh, if you look at the walls, there's an incredible amount of drawings that you see. Yeah. And I think that two, th two aspects contributed to that fact. I've never had an exhibition that I curated that had so many drawings. First of all, uh, unlike other exhibitions, we didn't have a year. <laughs> but I won't even tell you how fast the selection uh, process was. Uh, it was it was really instant. I was looking for the best works made about this or by women in this country. And I still looked at about 50 artists, more or less. Um, and there were so many other wonderful works. These are not the only ones, but I was looking at things that would be, um, that would speak to us. Uh, the society that doesn't have an, an understanding or an imagination, at least those who are not immigrants, of what a land invasion means, where there is no space you could escape. So I was thinking about certain works more than the others because I knew that would mean something for us or might, you know, explain the complexity, for example, of the social uh, uh, landscape of Donbas, which is a completely foreign uh, concept for us. So yes, uh, but I think what contributed to the amount of drawings in this exhibition is that drawings are the first medium that artists uh, uh, chooses as, as, a no, as a daily notation of what's happening and this chronological history of, of uh, Aleftina Kakiza's matter, for example, which is uh, just behind you and in front of me, is a very good example of like daily, they spoke daily and she daily noted their conversations and it's just a natural um, um, uh, medium for artists, especially when, you know, not everybody has access to a big studio, to materials anymore. The war puts, uh, arrests a lot of uh, what you had at your uh, disposal before the war, so there is a, there is a limitation to it as well. And Vlada's series behind you is yes. also a daily. Yeah, it's also a daily diary, and she did a similar work for which she's very famous during the Orange Revolution in 2014. Um, the, sorry, the Maidan Revolution in 2014, uh, which was called Kiev Diary. This is called Lviv Diary, and these are drawings that she uh, drew this spring and posted every day on Instagram. She continues to do that. Uh, Instagram actually kind of like became a shadow of this practice. So if you check these artists' Instagram feeds, you will see that these works are being continued as, as we speak, unfortunately. Um, so there, there, is, there is a need for this kind of uh, medium. Thank you so much. Uh, the artist and the curator will be available for, for the conversations and please do stay for their art talk at 3 p.m. and uh, for our re reception opening at 4. Thank you.